So, without further ado, it's an immense pleasure to introduce Olivia Harrison, Liv, who actually is, I think, very brave of doing, of coming here from New Zealand. Um, so, thank you for this already. <laughs> so, just, uh, just about Olivia. Olivia is actually a trained psychologist um, from New Zealand. You originate from, from New Zealand. And then Olivia did a PhD in psychology in, um, in Oxford, in clinical neuroscience, actually. Then went for a first postdoctoral research um, to autonomic neuroscience already, also in Oxford. Um, then got a Marie Curie Fellowship um, and chose to visit a friend of us um, in Zurich, Klaas Stefan. So she went with Klaas, um, or she's been with Klaas for three years. And then decided to go back to New Zealand to the University of Otago. This is in Dunedin. Um, that's the South Island, I guess. I've never been there, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, what should I say? Olivia is very well known for her work in autonomic neuroscience, especially in neuroimaging and computational aspects um, related to interoception, respiration, and how it perturbs, how you can perturb, actually, um, brain-body communication and learning from this. Olivia. Thank you. I tried to set you up. Perfect. Thank you very much. Good morning, zusammen. Grüezi miteinander. And kia ora koutou katoa from those from New Zealand. So thank you so much for having me, everyone. And where I'm from in New Zealand, we always start with, um, with where we're from and what we're connected to, just to start those um, connections that we find with each other and those um, shared pathways. So this is me from the South Island of New Zealand. This is near Christchurch, where I grew up. And um, as said, I studied at the University of Otago in neuroscience and exercise physiology. Then had the great pleasure of moving to the University of Oxford where um, I studied uh, neuroimaging and a bit more in depth in respiratory control. And then um, I was very, very lucky to go to um, Klaus Stefan's group in uh, the Translational Neuromodeling Unit in the beautiful Switzerland where the mountains uh, were fantastic and the cheese and chocolate were superb. <laughs> and now we've come back, all the way back to New Zealand to put it all together. And so what I... Uh, would like to invite you to do is to think about the last time you were really worried about something. Maybe it was an exam, maybe it, maybe it was a review, uh, maybe it was a bill in the mail, something that made you really worried. And not only can we remember those thoughts that raced around in our head, but also maybe what it felt like to be anxious or felt like to be worried about something in our body. So you might have felt a racing heart, you might have felt like you couldn't breathe deeply, you might have felt sweaty palms. And this is where my work uh, lies now. So in that communication between the brain and body, and in particular in states that we might be um, more or less anxious. And my focus is on breathing, and in particular breathing. So I want to just quickly embed this into what um, our wonderful clinicians with our psychiatrists and our psychologists are doing, trying to um, intervene in those thought pathways and uh, identify the cause of these issues. And our research really aims to give the tools that we can understand how it presents in the body and how we can may maybe um, break that cycle between brain and body so we don't exacerbate symptoms. So that's where our work lies. So we're all really familiar with those um, classical senses of what we call extraception, how we take information from the world and we bring it in and understand it inside uh, in our perceptions. And where I am now focused is on this idea of interoception, so autonomic signals coming from inside the body and how they are presented and perceived in the brain. And why is this even important, this neck up idea of what's happening? Well, we know that this brain-body mapping is disturbed with chronic physiological disease. If your autonomic uh, nervous system is dysregulated for a long time, we have this also change in our perception of these signals. We also now know in psychiatry that we have a dysregulation of our ability to perceive uh, signals from our body. And what often happens is that we have a combination of these uh, things, where if you have chronic physiological disease, we often have comorbidities of, chronic, uh, of psychiatric conditions as well. 
And like I said, I'm really interested in this within the breathing domain. So I'm just going to talk you through uh, the study that I did in Zurich um, for the last few years, where we were looking at people with anxiety who were normal, normal levels of anxiety. So we found people who had either very low levels of anxiety or moderate levels of anxiety. Think your typical university student was our moderate levels of anxiety. And we put them through a series of tests and we wanted to know, could we already measure and map this dysregulated perception within healthy levels of anxiety. So we first put them through some behavioural tests where we measured how sensitive they were to changes in their breathing, to very small changes. And then we also put them through some brain scanning, um, and in particular the 7 Tesla scanner in, um, at ETH. And how we changed breathing in this, uh, in this experiment was we used resistance. So if you imagine breathing through a really small straw and that difficulty that it, um, that it takes to inhale, that's the sort of thing we're dealing with. And what's nice about resistance is that we can change it, we can make it easier, we can make it harder, and it's also um, really well suited to brain scanning because it doesn't produce too many perturbations in CO2 which will mask our signal. So we use resistance. But obviously this caveats to say this is one autonomic signal or one signal coming from the body. There are so many other ways in which um, our breathing can change and other signals such as chemoreceptors, uh, so many other things. So this is just one, one avenue that we were looking at. So in our, in our um, behavioural task that we use, we developed um, a really simple, um, really simple task where we could give someone um, a breathing tube and uh, with a mouthpiece, and behind their back we could either add resistances or we could take them away. And really simple, um, they would take three breaths on a baseline, we'd either add a resistance or we'd take it off and add the sham, and they had three more uh, breaths against that. Then they had to report whether or not they uh, thought there was a resistance there, so a yes or no decision, and they had to rate their confidence in their decision. And we'll get to why that's important and what uh, these sorts of questions can give us in terms of interceptive measures. So the first thing we thought uh, to check against was sensitivity. How sensitive are these two groups? And by sensitivity, we mean that if you need a larger resistance, if you need that um, diameter cut to come down a lot, then you're less sensitive. You, you need a big stimulus to be able to feel it. Whereas if you only need a small change in resistance, then you're more sensitive. And if you asked any anxious person that you know whether or not they think they're good at perceiving their body or whether or not they think they're bad at perceiving their body, I can almost guarantee you they'll say they think they're good because we are vigilant towards our body and we are um, noticing any of these signals or we think we're noticing. But what happened is we're actually not. So this moderate anxiety group are less sensitive. They took a bigger stimulus to be able to feel this resistance change. And if you put this in the context of um, what the autonomic nervous system is doing, this probably makes sense. We know that these people with higher levels of anxiety have different parasympathetic, sympathetic balance, they have differences in their heart rate variability, their baseline level is quite different. So their ability to perceive a very small change in this breathing um, was actually worse. So this leads really nicely to this next part, which is metacognition. So metacognition is thinking about thinking, or so the process by which people self-reflect on their own performance or monitoring and how they maybe put that meta-knowledge to use in regula regulating their behaviour in terms of control. So we could also, with this task, measure aspects of metacognition. And the first aspect of metacognition is just how biased you are, whether or not you tend to use high confidence scores or low confidence scores as a measure of metacognitive bias. And as was, would probably be typical with anxiety, we do see a lowered overall confidence in those decisions. So even though on a higher level, subjectively, we think that we are very good at this, when you actually do the task, we, don't, uh, we have lower confidence levels when you are um, more anxious. And we have um, some work going on with my master's student at the moment who's mapping this into our functional connectivity at rest. And we see really nicely that these differences in metacognitive bias correlate really strongly with the amygdala connectivity to the insula, which is really cool. So we can see some of this mapping in our resting state brain networks as well. But we can uh, not stop at metacognitive bias. We can also measure insight. 
And by insight, I think the nicest way to conceptualize it is if you finished an exam and you walked out of the exam and you, without having your results, knew intuitively whether or not you'd done well or whether or not you'd done badly, and your, your results came back in and they mapped to what you thought, then you've got good insight. If you came out and you thought you failed but you ended up getting 95%, then you have poor insight. So how well do those confidence measures map onto your underlying performance? So for here, we use this, um, this model of interoceptive insight, where here we have an example of, at the top, someone with low insight, and at the bottom, someone with higher insight. So we take our confidence scores for when we were correct in green or incorrect in red. And the closer those distributions are together, the worse insight there is. We can't accurately assign confidence when we were right or when we were wrong. And on the bottom, there's a greater uh, separation between those distributions. So what we can do is we can take those distributions and we can map them onto something called a type 2 receiver operating characteristic curve, or a rock curve, where at the bottom we have um, the proportion of confidence measures when we're incorrect, and on uh, the y-axis we have the proportion of confidence measures when we're correct. And basically what happens is the more those distributions are separated, the more that curve bows up into the top corner. So then the area under that curve is um, one reflection of insight as well. But if we just take the area under the curve when we're, uh, then we're susceptible to things like the influence of underlying, um, underlying performance on the task. So what we do is we map this and we fit this parameter called meta d prime, which is basically saying what's the underlying performance that would uh, produce these confidence scores. And so we did this using um, Steve Fleming's hierarchical uh, metacognitive model. Um, I won't go into any further detail here, but basically when we have interoceptive tasks, we only have a few trials. We, we don't have the luxury of uh, doing visual tasks, but we can have hundreds of trials. This is tiring for our participants, so we only have, you know, in the order of maybe 60 to 100 trials. So that means that these hierarchical models can really help us um, to gain a little bit more power uh, and use the power of the group. So we fit this model and we say how insightful are our participants. We've seen how sensitive they were, we've seen that they have uh, a difference in their bias. How insightful are they? And here we saw a small difference in insight where the moderate anxiety group were less insightful than the low anxiety group. But this didn't come out with significance and this is a quite a difficult um, statistical threshold to get past because it's a difficult model to fit. So what we did to extend this a little bit further is we took um, this model and we made it into a, a regression model so that we could fit parameters that we thought might be related to this directly into the hierarchical model. Um, and this is work we did with Steve Fleming. So um, what we found is that in a different group where we looked and we saw uh, we used anxiety as one of these covariates of interest, we saw that insight was related to uh, anxiety, where the more anxious you are, the less insightful you are at, about your interoceptive performance. So this, we did this, and this was great, and this puzzled me for a little while, because this, um, this group of people, this was a data set from Oxford that we, that we used, was about 80 people, not that dissimilar to the 60 people we had in the Zurich data. And so this bugged me for a while. I was like, why is this difference here in the Oxford data and not in the Zurich data? So we've just recently finished a mega analysis where we took all the data from anyone who'd used this task um, that we were collaborating with. So we had data from Zurich and Oxford, Birmingham and Bath, and we had 175 people. And importantly, half of those were female, or half of those were women. In the Oxford data, it was about 80% women, and in the Zurich data, we had 50-50 of male and female. So we were really interested to see if we just put 175 people together, do we have the power to detect this, or is there something else going on? So in the first instance, yes, when we put them all together and we ran this again, we found this effect where the higher um, your anxiety, the lower your insight in this um, metacognitive uh, performance. But what was really interesting was that actually this effect is being driven by the woman. So we have a real difference in the way that anxiety is interacting with insight between the different genders. So overall, insight is exactly the same between men and women. But what's happening is that with higher levels of anxiety in women, we get that deficit in insight, and that relationship is different with men. Uh, so that was, uh, that was really interesting and something that we're uh, looking to take forward now. And just noting that with these things like, we know we have huge gender differences in anxiety and its prevalence in anxiety and depression, and there might be differences in these underlying mechanisms that are contributing to this. So yeah. 
Um, and then we took this one step further. So we didn't stop here, we also thought about learning because our world is not static. It doesn't just involve trait, um, trait properties that we have in terms of interoception, but we have to learn about things. So we know that if you're going to walk, say your office is on the fifth floor of a tall building and you walk in at the bottom and you know that by floor three, you're gonna to start to feel a little bit puffed, you're gonna feel um, your heart going a little bit more and we've learned those associations already. And it's really adaptive and helpful to let us do that. So this is what we did in our um, brain scanning session with these people in Zurich. And so how do you manipulate someone's breathing uh, inside a scanner, inside a 7T scanner, where you're a very long way away from the person, um, is we built a breathing system and a circuit where we have control from the outside in the scanner room. And basically it's a flow-mediated system. So we can uh, have nice, free-flowing, um, humid, air that comes to the participant, who is attached to the mouthpiece up there. And then uh, when we want to, we can turn it such that it, instead of being able to breathe the air that we supply, they have to breathe through a resistance that we can set. And that all happens outside, um, outside the scanner in the control room. And we had done some earlier iterations of this task with my work in Oxford, where we had used these associations, so we'd taken a cue, an abstract cue, and we'd paired that with a stimulus, so like what Julian was talking about with this associative learning. And we um, preconditioned people, so they knew that one cue meant they would get a resistance, and one cue meant they wouldn't get a resistance. And when we did this really simple version of the task, uh, we could map those areas of anticipation. When we know that this resistance is coming, we can uh, visualise it um, in our brain, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. And then we could also map what actually happens when we get that resistance. And we do a lot of careful denoising with this, with respiratory um, signals and cardiac signals. So we'll have some really interesting discussions about um, the signal that's involved in there and separating out um, those differences in noise and uh, neural fluctuations. But we mapped um, our anticipation and perception of these resistances. And importantly, we were really interested as to whether or not these uh, signals could be seen in the periaqueductal gray that Julian uh, mentioned earlier, that key part of that autonomic network between the brainstem and the higher cortical areas. And we did this at seven Tesla. And what we found is that um, in yellow, you could see the ventrolateral PAG in anticipation, and in blue, the lateral PAG when you actually got this perception of this resistance. So these signals um, of both anticipatory signals and perceptual signals, when we have these inspiratory resistances, are mapped through from, um, from the brainstem up into the midbrain before they hit the um, cortex. Not in a direction, I don't know the direction. <laughs> And so we extended this uh, in the Zurich study, where um, this time we asked them to predict. Uh, we didn't precondition, we let them learn in the scanner, and we asked them to predict whether or not there would be a resistance. So at first they didn't know, and then they could understand and, um, and figure out the cue pairing so that they could predict yes or no whether they thought there was a resistance. And we were mean, we changed it. So we let them settle, we had the about 30 trials where we kept it the same, and then we changed it a few times. And what this sort of uh, trial structure does is it lets us fit um, really simple associative learning models such that we can know how strong someone's predictions are. Uh, so here in blue is just the average trace from our, um, or the average um, learning prediction uh, trajectory from our participants. So you can see at the beginning, they're really not sure, and then it um, moves towards about 80%, which is where we're sitting at with our associations. And they're able to unlearn and relearn when we change those associations together. So we can get this prediction from, um, from this. This was just a Ruskola Wagner model. We can also interestingly get a map of their prediction errors. So if you thought something was gonna happen and you really strongly believed that and it didn't happen, you'll have a large prediction error. Whereas if you only had a weak prediction, you weren't so sure, you have a small prediction error. And so in psychiatry, um, there's been some debate as to whether or not anxiety might be associated with differences in our predictions, so thinking forward about what's going to happen, or possibly also and or our prediction errors, our ability to take those signals that come in when we're wrong and adapt from them. So we measured, uh, so we did this all together, and first we just mapped where those prediction and prediction errors uh, were showing up. So interestingly, we found the anterior insula as a really key area in this that was modulated um, by the strength of your predictions. And then, um, and we also got prefrontal areas in our predictions as well. And then we also mapped our errors, and we found, again, anterior insula, and this time also the periaqueductal gray when we were uh, mapping those prediction errors. 
And in terms of what differences we saw with anxiety, it really sat in that prediction domain. Um, this is where we were, um, had a difference or an interaction with how we weighed positive predictions, so when we weren't going to get a resistance, versus negative predictions, when we were going to get a resistance. So this plays really nicely into those ideas that valence and that idea of um, vigilance towards negative um, associations might, uh, might be showing up in anxiety. So where to from here? Um, we've mapped a little bit as to what, um, what the brain is doing when we perceive these inspiratory resistance signals in health uh, and trying to map those in really high levels of detail in the midbrain periodontal grey. We've also started looking at what differences we can see with anxiety, with just healthy levels of anxiety, and really we saw that um, these differences were there and present from low levels of um, perceptual processing of just uh, presence or absence of a signal through to metacognitive um, processes and then through to learning as well. And so the next step is what happens with treatment? What happens with our current treatment strategies? And in New Zealand, if you go to your doctor and you are um, asking for some help with something like anxiety or depression, our first port of call is usually something like a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, we have a not enough capacity of, um, of therapists um, who are able to help behaviourally with this, and so usually the first, the first pass is um, some sort of anti-anxiety medication. So we are uh, catching people before or within the first few days of taking this medication, and then again after eight weeks or so, and we're doing this whole sw uh, suite of measures on interoception. What we're also really keen on with this insight idea is that uh, this insight property of interoception is something that we've really seen in this, but it hasn't been shown in similar tasks in the visual domain. So uh, Steve Fleming's group do this task of a visual perception task, and they don't see any changes in insight with anxiety if it's in the visual domain. So we're really interested as to what SSRIs are doing and which aspects of interoception they might be allowing us, um, or which, which types of interoception are we able to um, improve and maybe get better connected with our body, and one of the ways that we can maybe think about helping a bit further with things like breathing exercises, like what Julian was talking about. We're also running a big study with exercise. So this is people who have moderate levels of anxiety who don't do much exercise, and we're randomizing them into either an exercise, um, aerobic exercise intervention or a stretching exercise intervention. And we know that exercise works for anxiety. We know that sitting and thinking about your body works for anxiety. So we hope that both of these things will improve it. But what we want to know is what are they doing? Which aspects of interoception are they changing? What are they allowing us to do? And then the step beyond that is how do we do that better? But if we're first armed with the knowledge with some of these things, um, what can we change in how we perceive our body signals, then these are things that we can um, focus on and uh, maybe help people to understand when their anxiety is improving that these things are also improving and that's something they can take forward as a tool to help manage their symptoms. Um, I don't do this alone. I have an amazing research group and uh, lots of collaborating partners. So this is us in New Zealand. That's my brain. That's, that's what it usually looks like, especially when I'm away and they're furiously emailing me. Um, and obviously we have a huge um, number of supporters and uh, collaborators across the world, so I'm very grateful to be involved in this um, and really, uh, really happy to be thinking about uh, the place of interoception within autonomic neuroscience. So thank you very much. Nice and quick, lots of time Thank for questions. Yes. Thank you. Because everybody is hungry, so mm. that was brilliant. Thanks, <laughs> Liv. Um, other questions? I would have a couple of questions, but it relates to the model, so it's probably not for this audience. <laughs> yes. Liv, did you notice any uh, laterality effects in your, your imaging studies? We definitely have some laterality in the PAG. Um, that it's, it's more one-sided than the other. I can't, in my head, turn the image around. But yes, there's definitely, in the anticipatory domain, there's definitely that. Um, and then there's a few other images. I didn't directly test left versus right, but it's, it's not exactly the same. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Eva. Hi, that was very nice. So just to come back to the um, prediction error, mm -hmm. so is anxiety modulating the areas that the prediction error? Not, no. We didn't see any association with anxiety so in the prediction error. Like mm -hmm. no. As a 
anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always see anxiety as such a um, as such a uncertainty about the future. It's very forward thinking, but you need your prediction errors associated in that as well. So this is obviously all the constraints of just one task, one way of looking at it, um, and yeah, and, and one interceptive measure. So definitely. Um, I'm not saying that anxiety is not involved in prediction error processing. It's also that we had healthy levels of anxiety. So it might be that beyond that, up into more disturbed clinical levels of anxiety, that there might be uh, prediction error changes. But we were going with 60 people going into the seven Tesla scanner and we didn't, with a breathing tube. So we didn't want to um, move into a clinical level of anxiety at that stage. So I would say we didn't see it, but that does not mean it's not there. Inaccurate. Yes. Inaccurate, right? so so, the, the yes, exactly. So we definitely saw that difference in how they predict positive and negative. Um, but and also I also used a very simple learning model. So there are lots uh, there are lots of other ways we could analyze this, but with the caveat of only having 80 trials as well, because every time you give them a resistance, it's, you have to recover from that as well. So the time delay means that this this task took half an hour or so in the seven Tesla, and so there's only so much you can ask people to do. It's also not very nice. Did you to? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was wondering um, whether you have asked the participants, or whether you know, or whether generally known, um, is this restricted breathing something unpleasant? So if in the context of a task like this, is it knowing um, that there is a cue predicting that I will be restricted, is that something positive or negative? So um, definitely we, we measure um, how anxious they were in terms of thinking about, or in terms of the stimuli themselves. The moderate anxiety group found it much more anxiety inducing than the low anxiety group. So it's, uh, but it depends on the person. Some people aren't bothered by it at all and some people are, are very afraid of it. So it, it really is um, depending on the person. We do remove, uh, we pre-screen out anyone who has asthma because it definitely we've we've uh, seen it behaviourally where um, some people really identify that signal as quite closely related to what they feel with if they have an asthma attack. So we don't have people with um, with asthma. So yeah. And, and did you consider this? Did you take this into account in your computational models um, with respect to the valence of prediction hours and so on? If you consider this event as something like punishment or punishment or mission, mm -hmm. which varies across other persons. Yes, so that's what we, I didn't, I didn't look at it directly how it varied with their anxiety scores, but that's where we saw the difference between the groups, so between the positive valence and the negative valence. So we took the stimuli with that they considered like positive, that they weren't going to get a resistance, and negative, that they were going to get a resistance, and that's where we saw that difference between uh, the groups with anxiety, where that um, weighing up positive and negative is different in the anterior insula in the people with higher levels of anxiety. And this was based on these uh, ratings, like which differed. It was based on their predictions that it was one cue or the other. So we had a general assumption that the omission is a is a positive thing, and the um, because they did they did report that they uh, they found it quite intense and they were anxious about it definitely. So there's there's above zero that it's not just a neutral stimulus for sure. Yeah. But it could be even more precise. Yes. You would use yes, it could be. About how yes. Yes, it could be. I just did the group differences. So yeah, but we do have a measure of how anxious they found. Not how unpleasant, how anxious. So yeah, there's, there's definitely differences between those, but I didn't map the individual anxiety scores. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Nice work there. Um, you may have mentioned it, but were you, with respect to the anxiety scores, was that state or trait? Trait. It was trait levels. Okay. Yeah. Which, yeah. There are many ways of measuring uh, trait levels of anxiety. Thankfully, um, when we brought them, so we, we pre-screened them online and then brought them in, and they had distinctly different scores of anxiety and depression and fatigue and all of those other measures that we took of them as well. So, And with respect to the sex differences, did mm -hmm. you factor in cycle, you know, Cycle. No, we just looked at trait levels, and there weren't any sex differences that we saw in this group uh, when we had, in terms of this, uh, these sorts of things. Wasn't but we didn't. Look. Pardon? Wasn't the yeah. So no, that was with um, insight. So when we took that insight score, but other than the like the the 
st uh, trait measures of anxiety or anything like that, they were the same between the groups. Yeah. What was, I can't remember, what was the takeaway message with differences between men and women with respect to insight? So, uh, with so insight, yes, yeah. with, <laughs> with insight, overall, they're exactly the same between men and women. Are you going to say that? Yes. <laughs> So there's no difference on average. What, di what happens is with higher levels of anxiety, we see that there's um, lowered interoceptive insight in women, but not in men. And what property this relates to really strongly is how much you catastrophize. So that real catastrophizing um, part of anxiety, which is often more prevalent in women, that was related to how much your insight uh, went down with anxiety. So it just means that possibly anxiety might present differently. It might be that some of the symptoms that we consider to be anxious symptoms may be different between men and women. It's, it's sort of, I want you to speculate on this because maybe I didn't get it well. So from what I understood, you were mentioning that the perception of the interoceptive perception is diminished with anxiety but not the external perception, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. is, is this... Uh, general thing that the more anxious you are mm -hmm. the less perception you have of your, of your insight but you're more aware of your thoughts this, so this is what we're doing at the moment. These have been different populations. So we're currently, with all of our um, participants now, running both interoceptive and extraceptive tasks so that we can directly see in the same population if this is something that's different. But it, uh, speculating, it makes a little bit of sense. If you're in a crisis, what you want is your anxious friend because your anxious friend is fantastic at thinking about all the different possibilities and what could happen because that worry about it is gone. And so all the skills they use to catastrophize are then able to be used in a logical manner. Um, so we're definitely interested in seeing whether or not it's specific to interoception. So we will know soon. <laughs> um, yeah, a great talk. Thank you. So um, uh, I just want to follow up on what Boyana asked. So um, did you uh, did you see any group differences in terms of uh, learning rates or in terms no. of like, positive versus negative updating or something like that? No, we didn't see any differences in learning rate. We didn't fit uh, different learning rates for positive and negative. It's something that I'm still in the pipeline that I need to have a look at. So we didn't see any differences in learning rate. We did see a little bit of difference in the, um, in the model evidence for what models should be used. So we pre-registered what we were going to do and we said if there wasn't a um, winning model, a definitive winning model, we set really high criteria, we would just fall back and use a Riscola Wagner really si simple associative learning model. But actually we were having a look at this um, the other day and the differences between the groups, uh, it seems that there's quite, uh, we also used a two level HGF which is basically just a Kalman filter and between the two groups, between the anxiety groups, one group was sort of quite strongly in favour of the Kalman filter and one was didn't have that. So there's possibly differences going on in how they are doing this task between the groups, but not something I've had a look at. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So if there is no further immediate questions, I get signs that there is the lunch outside. <laughs>